whole idea here is, is a very large view of what Italy looks like. So Italy is, is a country that's divided into 20 different regions. And we're going to talk about, obviously, Tuscany today, but it's also important to talk about kind of why Tuscany is as important as it is, but also um, the, the elements of Italy that really define the growing area itself. Okay, so when we talk about Italy, we really talk about it into four quadrants. Uh, four, you can call it four territories, whatever the term you want to use. And I'm going to point, hopefully you can see, excuse me, you can, that's the wine working. You can see my cursor on your screen. Rob, you see a cursor in the top right? Okay, so we're going to talk about really in terms of areas of Italy. We talk about it in four different areas. We talk about the northeast which contains both the Trentino Alto Adige, the Veneto, the Veneto being the number one uh, producing region in all of Italy in terms of total production. And then we also talk about the Friuli Venezia. Uh, then we have what's called the, the Northwest, very simple, where we have the Val d'Aosta, the Piedmonte or the uh, Piedmont, we have Liguria, we have Emilia Romagna, and then we have Lombardy. Technically, Emilia Romagna is a hybrid. It by, basically sits both sort of Northwest, as you can see, and then also part of Central Italy, which is the next part. And in Central Italy, we can include a parts of Emilia-Romagna, Tuscany, the Marche region, Umbria, Lazio, uh, and then Abruzzi. Lazio is where Rome is. So those of you that have traveled to Rome, that's actually the region that you're flying into. Uh, and then today we're gonna be talking obviously about Tuscany. Uh, Tuscany being the most important brand of Italian wine to the rest of the world. Uh, and then the last area is basically Southern Italy, Southern Italy being everything else. So in Southern Italy, we have Campania, uh, really the most important region to the Romans, mainly because of, um, uh, of the, the amount of vines that are planted there, but also in Campania is where we have Naples. And Naples is probably the most important food culture in terms of Italian food that has actually reached the United States. So when you talk about all your marinara based dishes, um, um, all of that comes from Naples, which sits in Campania. Uh, we have Basilicata, which is basically the arch. We have Calabria, the toe. We have uh, Apulia, the heel. And then we have the two islands, Sicily uh, and Sardinia. And <clears throat> what's very interesting is that when we talk about Italian growing areas, 20 growing areas, all 100% very, very independent from one another in terms of their food and wine culture. And what I really mean by that is when you look at um, kind of how a country is formed, particularly in terms of the culture of a country, Italy is essentially 20 independent cultures, 20 independent countries that decided in 1860 to become one unified country. And as some of you may know, or I'm gonna assume that you know, that when we talk about French wine or European wine, Italian wine, any European wine, all of those wines are basically defined by some law or some tradition that has been turned into law or codified in terms of uh, how that wine is produced. So this idea that wines meet certain minimum standards, both in terms of varietals, where they can grow, how they can grow, when they can be sold, when they can be harvested, all of those laws that govern production are unique to each individual appellation within a region. But when we talk about Italian wines specifically, the Italians are always the most complicated. Um, and there's many, many reasons for that. One is that Italian, it, uh, Italy in general has more native indigenous varietals than any other country on the planet, uh, upwards of basically 2,400 different grapes that are uniquely grown in Italy. Okay, so where we left off was we're talking about Italy wine law, uh, and how Italy is the most complicated, complicated in terms of not only the number of grapes that they grow, but also in the fact that uh, when Italy became a country in 1861, uh, we talk about these 20 growing regions really as independent countries prior to that. But when Italy became a unified country in 1861, it would take them until 1972, 1973 for them to figure out how to take each individual region's wine cultures and apply them to uh, uh, a law where every region could agree. You know, when we talk about how uh, wine laws were created in France, which is really the home of all these wine laws in the first place that the EU eventually adopted, wine laws in France were, were basically created 
uh, right before World War II, and then the first vintage after World War II, they were adopted. So the first, it, it, let's talk about it in terms of governed wine region, occurred in France in 1936, 1937, and then going into World War II, kind of nothing happened. And then the first vintage after World War II, 1945, was really the first year where these wine laws actually started to take place. So the French have been able to figure out how to create wine laws that every region within France, all 14 of them, could agree to. In Italy, it literally took them 100 years to figure out and agree to what uh, was going to what was going to happen and and how to move forward in terms of selling and talking about Italian wine to the rest of the world. Okay, so there's a couple of definitions on here. I'm not worried about this. These are slides taken directly from a level one certification. Uh, those of you that have taken wine certifications, whether through the International Wine and Spirits Guild or through another association, you have access to maps. If you need maps, just send me an email or send me a private message and I will send you maps uh, uh, in a PDF form. Although Wine Folly seems to really have some of the best maps out there that you can buy or even just, uh, um, I don't want to say steal, but just <laughs> like uh, screen, screen, uh, capture, capture your screen, and there you have a map. You know, it's a beautiful situation. Okay, so again, 20 regions, we're talking about Tuscany, the number one brand of Italian wine, and there's many reasons for that. That's part of the history of Tuscany wine. Why is Tuscany uh, the most recognized brand of Italian wine outside of Italy? We're going to talk about that. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about the terroir of Italy. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, let's see if I can get this to show up. Does that map show up? Beautiful. Yeah. Everything is working so far. <laughs> drink. Everyone drink. We should make this a drinking game. We're fighting off coronavirus one sip at a time. Yes, we are. Here, here. Cheers to that. I miss you guys. I wish we could be open and we could do this in person, but sometimes uh, this is actually fun for a lot of people. One, because you can drink as much as you want and you don't have to drive anywhere. So it's a, it's a win-win. And okay, so we're gonna talk about key Italian wine styles. I'm not really concerned about the wine styles themselves. I wanna talk about why Italy is unique from a terroir perspective. Why are there so many different regions that produce so many unique different styles? And then we'll kind of feed this into the conversation about Tuscany. Okay, so when we talk about, <coughs> excuse me, when we talk about Italy, there are four uh, major uh, things that affect the terroir of a growing place in Italy. And two of them are mountain ranges, mountain ranges, and two of them are bodies of water. So at the very northern part of Italy, we have basically the French and Italian Alps. Um, and hopefully my cursor you can see. Then we have uh, the second mountain range is the Apennines. The Apennines basically go, they divide, basically right here is Piedmont and where the mountain range is basically cuts off Piedmont from Liguria. Um, Liguria is the home of Cinque Terra. If you've never been to Cinque Terra, that's the very famous postcard that has homes on the water on the cliffside. Okay, so the Apennines basically cut the region vertically in half from north to south all the way to basically the Mediterranean. Okay, so you have two bodies of, you have two bodies of water, two mountain ranges. The first body of water is basically what is known as the Tyrrhenian Sea, which really is a body of water that feeds the Mediterranean Ocean. And then on the other side, on the eastern side over here, you have the Adriatic Sea. So two bodies of water, two mountain ranges that define kind of the terroir of a place. The other thing that really makes Italy quite exceptional, exceptional is the fact that as you go from north of the country to south of the country, you're getting from a very cool climate to a very warm climate. And not only are you having a change in temperature, but you also have degrees of latitude uh, based off of where you are on the mountain ranges. And so one of the things that defines the laws of a particular place in Italy are not just the soil and the climate and um, the grapes, but also the altitude of actually where that grape is grown according to uh, where it sits on that mountain range. And so we talk about the, the foothills of things. Uh, most of 
the growing areas in Italy are not in a rain shadow effect like you would think because they're sitting on a mountain range. And that's mainly because they are mitigated by the two bodies of water. So humidity and breezes are both on both sides of the country. And therefore there is issues in the growing season with rain, with humidity uh, that you see across the country. And so in terms of organic farming, um, while organic farming is really the first type of farming because technology wasn't advanced back, you know, 300, 400, 500 years ago, uh, in terms of um, man-made chemicals, um, the idea of <clears throat> Producing far and farming grapes organically is is much more difficult in these places just because uh, of the humidity. So as you go up in altitude, you tend to lose less of that. So as you go up in altitude, not only do you get less disease pressure, but you also get a little bit more rugged terrain, obviously, and therefore you stress your vines more, so you get more concentrated fruit, and therefore you produce a, a better style wine. Okay. The other thing that makes Italy unique in terms of how those these 20 regions are are kind of created um, and define themselves is that because this mountain range goes from the center of the country all the way from north to south, um, when we talk about the rivers of a place, the rivers actually go from the center part of the country outward as you move north to south. There isn't <coughs> a river that actually connects northern Italy to southern Italy. The only thing that connects those two places of Italy is getting on a boat, traveling the ocean, uh, and connecting to that place. So there isn't a river system that connects these multiple regions. And therefore, trade historically has always been very difficult. And therefore, because there's a lack of connectedness in a place, there's the need to create your own identity. And therefore, we have 20 unique both wine cultures, food cultures, and just different customs across the country. So again, this is kind of the reason why uh, Italy is complicated, is that we have 20 regions that can't agree uh, on terms of what needs to happen. They grow different grapes, they have different cultures, different customs, and to actually put that into a law where all kind of, kind of follow it took literally a little over 100 years to figure that out. Um, okay, so, Obviously, this is, has a lot more content on this slide than, than is really necessarily necessary. Let's backtrack and, or let's move forward rather, and talk about Tuscany specifically. <clears throat> Italy map, where's Tuscany? Okay. Okay, you guys. Okay, so when we talk about Tuscany, um, this is a super old region. It really dates back all the way to the Etruscans period, all the way to 8th century BC, but it really wouldn't be until really the Renaissance where we see Tuscany become the, the giant that it is, both in terms of brand, but culture that it gives off to the rest of the world. Um, so when we talk about Tuscany, there's a couple of things that we need to establish first and foremost, which is kind of uh, obviously the regions, but um, this idea of how Tuscany has fed the rest of the world with one key grape, and that grape is Sangiovese, and that's the grape that you're drinking. Sangiovese <coughs> is the number one planted grape in Italy, red grape. Trebbiano, the white grape of Tuscany, is the number one planted white grape in Italy. Um, and so... Tuscany is obviously given its, uh, its, uh, its um, reputation and its, uh, its wherewithal to the rest of the regions around it. And part of this conversation is gonna feed into uh, the, the relationship between Cabernet Sauvignon and Tuscany in particular. And that's why I paired the cab with this class, not because it's Lodi specific cab, but just Cabernet Sauvignon in general. Obviously, uh, there's cabs from all over the world, but that's the cab that we had from Vinovium, so I wanted y'all to share it uh, by default. So um, when we talk about Tuscany, really there are 15 main growing areas. In terms of classified growing areas, in terms of Italian wine law, there is a level of Italian wine law called DOCG, basically a controlled area that's controlled and guaranteed. That's what the G stands for, is guaranteed. It doesn't mean uh, 
you have to like it. That's not what that guaranteed means. What it guaranteed means is that it has been guaranteed to reach a certain level of requirements to be met to be called that name. And that level of guarantee is uh, more extreme than what you see at the DOC level. So in Italy, you have four levels of classification. You have your table wine, vino de tavola. You have your country wine, basically a vin de Italy, a wine of Italy. You have a DOC step, which is a controlled wine of origin. And then you have a controlled and guaranteed wine of origin known as your DOCG. And in the world of DOCG, Italy is number three in terms of total DOCGs compared to the rest of Italy. The Veneto being number two, and then the Piedmont being number one in terms of total DOCGs. Um, in total, there's about 44 DOCGs uh, in Italy across all 20 regions. So Tuscany having the third most. All right, so let me pull up my, I forgot my agenda. <laughs> Have another drink. Yeah, keep drinking. <laughs> okay, recipes for production. Okay, wonderful. Moving right along. It's only been uh, 30 minutes and I'm on my third bullet because I like to talk too much. Okay, so recipes for production. This is kind of feeding into the brand of Tuscany. Why is Tuscany the brand that it is? Uh, okay, when we talk about Sangiovese, Sangiovese is an indigenous varietal to Tuscany. Um, it's a grape that has been taken everywhere else outside of Tuscany over time. But historically, <laughs> Tuscan wines, and particularly the main villages of Tuscany, both, both Florence, the village of Chianti and Siena in the south, um, those are all villages that have always produced a red wine from Tuscany that was Sangiovese based, and that as the Medici family kind of moved in in the, in the 1400s all the way up until the mid uh, 1700s, it was during this period of the Renaissance where the brand of Tuscany started to become um, very, very important. And as a brand, you need to have some level of consistency. So what ended up happening is that there is a actual, a royal decree, Tuscany being really the first region on the planet to have a, a law, or you can call it a decree by a monarch, to, to tell you that a wine has to be produced in a certain way. That wine had to be basically a 70% blend of Sangiovese and then a 30% blend uh, of basically other indigenous varietals. And those other indigenous varietals include both two white grapes, Malvasia and Trebbiano, and then two, two other red grapes, Caniolo Nero um, and uh, Colorino. And so as long as you have 70% Sangiovese, you can blend 30% of any other varietal and as a result, this recipe, if you will, becomes the brand of Tuscan wine, okay? So let's fast forward to the modern period where we have the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s and in the early 1900s where people are able to move around the world, goods and services are able to be transported a lot quicker and a lot easier, the brand just expands. So prior to this, the main production for grape growing um, is the region between Florence here in the north and basically Siena here in the south. <clears throat> okay, also known as Chianti. So what ends up happening is as we move into the 20th century, the brand of Chianti becomes uh, more and more important. Production needs to expand. The recipe becomes this guiding principle in terms of how wines are produced. And so they keep producing more and more of this kind of 70% Sangiovese blend that is now known as Tuscan wine, uh, but more specifically known as Chianti. Um, and all of us have experienced, I'm, I'm assuming all of us have experienced these, these wines from Tuscany that are in uh, squatty bottles that have a, a reed flask around them. Uh, those reed flasks are actually known as fiascos because ultimately, I don't know why they call them fiascos, but it's kind of funny to think about how those wines are fiascos today because they are not nearly as good as the other wines. And they're always at the bottom shelf in your grocery store. And those are the ones that you drink and then you turn them into candles with a checkered, red, white checkered uh, linen on top, you know? So it's, um, this is the brand of, of Tuscany. It's a, it's a simple Sangiovese based table wine. So this is occurring all the way up until, all the way through World War II. <clears throat> 
And then after World War II, 1945, going into the 50s, uh, and, and specifically going into the 60s, 1960, we start to see a shift. And that shift is a, is a producer that no longer wants to follow the recipe. So what do they do? They, they according to the law, the, the classification system, if they don't follow that recipe, their wine is automatically downgraded in terms of quality. And I say the word quality uh, as we understand it to be, which is doesn't taste as good, it's not as good of a wine, but in their world, the word quality really means this idea of uh, not meeting standards. And so it's downgraded based on quality for not meeting the minimum standard to be used as a, a, a wine from a given place that has a particular name. So this results in a lot of frustration and we start to shift into a situation where we see the, the addition of Cabernet coming onto the scene, um, which then feeds into the conversation of super Tuscans. So I'm gonna talk about briefly about Cab and super Tuscans, and then we'll talk specifically about uh, Vino Noble di Montepulciano uh, and where that wine is today and where it came from. Okay, so uh, what ends up happening is, uh, Right before World War II, obviously Italy is not part of the Allies, <clears throat> so that so so Italy gets basically cut off from the rest of the world, at least from the Allied world, the Western world, all through the period of World War II. Um, but prior to that, there is a very famous royal family known as the Medici family that still is around till this day. But prior to World War II, there was a the noble family basically hired a very famous winemaking family known as the Antonori family, also still around today, um, that they hired them to make wine for their personal consumption. Part of the story goes is that, that the royal family really enjoyed Cabernet Sauvignon specifically. So the Antonori winemaker, Caesar Antonori, basically went out and, and captured Cabernet Sauvignon vines from France. They came back and planted them in, uh, in Tuscany, basically in and around Bulgari, which is, um, Bulgari, it's 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 a it's a scattered place. Number kind of number five, you can kind of see it. Um, uh, Carmignano is close to it. It's really kind of this blue, kind of feeding into this red area. Um, and then there's also spots that are also considered Bulgari, kind of closer to the coast. <clears throat> um, so they planted Cabernet in this location, and over time. Uh, they start to use this Cabernet to make a Cabernet-based wine for this family. And then in 1968, they realized that uh, the family has produced too much wine. They need to release it to the open market. And basically, because it does not fit the, the laws of what a Sangiovese-based wine in Tuscany is, it's downgraded as, to a table wine status within the country. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is that this wine turns out to be the most expensive wine being produced in, in Tuscany, and it becomes a major uh, sore spot for the region, mainly because uh, you have your most expensive wine being classified as your lowest quality wine, and that becomes a problem. And then in 1974, 75 timeframe, um, Decanter Magazine actually gets a hold of, a, of this wine which eventually becomes known as Sassacaya, the first and most important super Tuscan wine. And Decanter Magazine does a review, does a, a profound write-up and uses the term super Tuscan, and that's where the term super Tuscan uh, comes from. Um, that is a term that has like infected the rest of the world uh, many, many, many times over. And not because we use the term super Tuscan on, on other wines, but because of what super Tuscans really mean. A, a super Tuscan wine really means um, French varietals with French technique. And when we talk about French technique, that really implies both uh, small format barrels versus very large botti, which is uh, 500, 600, 1,000, 1,500 liters uh, large format barrels that are very classic in Italian wine production. Much less, it's not French oak, it's typically Slovenian oak in Italy. So it's, there's many implications that the Super Tuscan model has created. Today, while we still apply the term Super Tuscan to wines of Tuscany that are produced using French grapes and French technique, 
the term that we use today is really the international style of wine production, which is this hyper focus Slovenian oak. I got a question. So, oh, I got several questions. It's isn't San Gio, San Gio about the easiest to grow in Texas in the hill country? And then the second question, say it again, what kind of oak? Okay, uh, the type of oak is Slovenian oak from Slovakia. Yep, you got it. Thanks, Rob. And then easiest to grow, I don't know, I don't know about easiest to grow. Um, the problem with San Giovese, as, we'll, as you can even see in your glass, is it technically is a very thin skinned varietal. Um, so it's sometimes difficult to get color. You need a full growing season to get all your phenolic ripeness, meaning all your color out of that varietal. Um, it is a grape that does very well, mainly because we have very calcium rich clay type soils here. Um, and that seems to do well. Can a super Tuscan be a DOCG? The answer is no. Um, there is no, even the most important super Tuscan Sassicaia is not a DOCG. Um, um, I guess, let me back up. There is an exception. Uh, and your exception is, let me see, region number, number five, Carmignano. Carmignano is the only DOCG where Cabernet and Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot are actually allowed and required as part of the blends. But they have been producing that wine way before um, they were being produced by the Medici and the Antonori family in the uh, prior World War I and post-World War II period. Um, that's the only exception. And when you find those wines in the market, they're great values. They're not easy to find because there's not a lot of those producers in that region in the first place that have enough to export. So the number five region here is really the first, uh, you wanna if you technically call it super Tuscan in terms of using French varietals, but they are not uh, historically using the, 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 the profound influence of small oak, new French oak barrels that a true super Tuscan is doing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's also one other kind of, this is, uh, we're getting into more detail, but one of the thing that's unique about a Super Tuscan wine in the first place is that they are not regional wines. They are typically all single vineyard wines. And so that's the other unique thing about a Super Tuscan is not only is it uh, applying French grapes with French technique, but they've also applied this idea of French monoculture, meaning I'm planting a specific grape in a specific place, a vineyard, several vineyards, whatever it is, but typically it's a, a crew, a vineyard. Um, and so those wines are unique to that one vineyard. Um, and it's only in France where we have this uh, idea of a single vineyard growing area, meaning it's a vineyard that has its own appellation, if you will. Um, and if at some point in the future they decide to upgrade Super Tuscans into their own tier as single vineyard wines, that's gonna be a, an interesting day for the wine industry because that automatically implies that those single vineyards become their own growing areas instead of being within a larger appellation or a larger commune. Oh, well, let me finish the thought about branding. <coughs> so the brand grows, the idea of more Tuscan, we need more Tuscan wines. Uh, we have these producers who eventually decide to go against that grain, but the idea of where we get Chianti and Chianti Classico from, like we see in several places around Italy, is we have this expansion of a brand. We need to produce more wines under that brand. How do we do that? We basically just expand the territory. So what ends up happening in 1960, they basically start to create larger areas known as Chianti. And when they do that, they basically limit the original districts of Chianti and they call that Chianti Classico. So now number seven on your page is Chianti Classico. And then everything in blue, number six here, is essentially what is known as Chianti. These two wines are not created equal uh, by any means, both in terms of quality requirements for production. If you're gonna go out and buy a Chianti, buy a Chianti Classico. If you need a $7 wine that you need to bring to a dinner party where you don't really like the people, take them a Chianti, okay? They'll be like, oh, it's so fancy, but it's not really Chianti Classico. <laughs> uh, I know that's a shitty thing to say, but you kind of get the idea. They are not equal wines <laughs> by any means, okay? Now, within the, the boundary of Chianti, number six, the larger blue area, 
uh, we're moving on to uh, Montepulciano. So in the, in the larger region of Chianti, number 15, you can see, is a sub-district, a, a more established region uh, within the larger Chianti district. And the, you can kind of see this outline that's this lime green. And this lime green is essentially a, a, hilltop, vin, a hilltop village. And every, all, the villi, all the vines are basically on the slopes of this hilltop uh, village. And so when we talk about Vino Noble de Montepulciano, there's a couple of things that we need to address right off the bat, like the confusion of its name, what makes it so noble historically that really, what does it mean today? And let's start with the first question. When we talk about Vino Noble de Montepulciano, the town, the village name is Montepulciano, not the great Montepulciano. When we get to, uh, um, I'm gonna point over, <laughs> over a region, Kind of in Abruzzi, uh, we have another town called, another wine called Montepulciano de Abruzzo, or Montepulciano de Abruzzi. That is the name of the grape Montepulciano from the village or the region of Abruzzi. Here in Tuscany, it's not that way. This is not the grape Montepulciano. This is the grape Sangiovese, but the village name is actually Montepulciano. So there's an identity crisis for a lot of buyers in terms of what they're buying. So when we talk about Vino Noble de Montepulciano, it's the noble vine or the noble wine of Montepulciano, not the great Montepulciano. We are still talking about Sangiovese when we talk about this wine. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the history of the place in terms of uh, why don't we know about this wine really today? Most people go out and buy Chianti's or Chianti Classico's Brunello de Montalcino, which is basically the town directly east of Montepulciano, is probably the most famous Sangiovese produced wine in Tuscany. Nacho. Sorry. Um, and so why don't we know about Vino Noble? Well, in reality, Vino Noble is a region that uh, became a rock star very early in its creation. Basically, in the 1680s going into the 1700s is when Vino Noble became uh, the most important wine of Tuscany, mainly because during the Renaissance period, it was a region that was heavily written about and therefore became the wine of nobility and therefore it became uh, a very prominent, highly branded uh, and reputable wine. Over the course of time, this falls out of favor, mainly because um, Vino Noble basically loses its identity in terms of what that wine represents. It, it, over time, it starts to follow this idea of what a Chianti-based wine is, which historically is a wine that can be blended up with up to 20 to 30 percent of white grapes. Uh, and then we have the Super Tuscan trend, which eventually says, well, you can blend French varietals. Well, that really doesn't work very well in this particular place in, in Tuscany as well as it does further north, where those cab varietals have an even longer growing season and can ripen fully, so you get full flavor of those wines. Um, so it's a, it's a region that, uh, for by and large, has not really dedicated itself to producing fine wine in the modern world. And it is only recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, post-1980 really, um, where we see Vino Noble start to define itself in a more serious way. And what I mean by that is that when you create a, a system of governance that says you can only put 10% of a particular varietal in your wine versus 20, 30%, you create a little bit more focus, a little bit more structure, and a little bit more seriousness for the place. So today, when we talk about Vino Noble de Montepulciano, we talk about a region that really in terms of varietal concentration, is a minimum of 70% Sangiovese. The other 30% has to be red varietals and only a maximum of 10% can be um, um, French varietals, Cav or Merlot. Now, which means that there's still a lot of producers that go above and beyond or choose a different path. Some of them are producing 100% Sangiovese. Some of them are producing 90% uh, with other indigenous red varietals from Tuscany. And so it's very important that you know your producers. And now in the last five, five years, there's been a movement of noble 
wine growers and wine producers in Vino Noble to actually go back to the roots of the place, which is indigenous varietals, a focus really on 90 to 100 percent Sangiovese that are trying to protect the name of what it means to be Vino Noble. Um, when we talk about what the difference is between, let's say, Vino Noble de Montepulciano and uh, Brunello de Montalcino and Chianti Classico, the three big uh, red wine Sangiovese regions, really, it's, it's quite simple. As you move further north, um, you tend to get cooler climates, which means that you tend to get a little bit more acid structure. Um, and then when you apply that to oak, you get a little bit more firmness, if you will. The wines tend to be, um, I'm going to use a term called crunchy, but it's this idea of both tannin and acid. They tend to be a little bit more really just crunchy, and then they need more time to age. Uh, when we get to Montalcino, we have a, a, an entirely new clone of Sangiovese called Brunello. Uh, and Brunello... Oh. <laughs> what was that? That was a moan. I love um, it. Oh, I'm going to moan with you, too. <laughs> yeah. You get Brunello, and Brunello is a much darker, thicker skin clone of Sangiovese. You get more tannins. You get more body. Uh, you get wines that are more uh, age-worthy. But also, you notice that Montalcino... <coughs> is closer to the Mediterranean. And so you get a little bit more of a Mediterranean climate. Um, you get a little bit more rainfall in the growing season. Um, and then we get to uh, Montepulciano. Montepulciano seems to be uh, a, a hybrid of these two. The wines tend to be softer. Um, the tannins a little bit more integrated, a little bit softer tannins, not as nearly much acid. The wines can be very age worthy, but uh, they're also a little bit less recognized in the other two regions. And I think this is, if you're looking for premium Sangiovese from Tuscany, Vino Noble is really going to find your best value. You can get 90 plus rated wines easily under $30. Um, like this particular wine, this wine was about $28, $30 uh, retail if you were to go out and buy it. Um, and then they have the Reserva. So in terms of winemaking protocol, while we have a varietal requirement, we also have an aging requirement. And so for Vino Noble, Montepulciano, non-reserva, it's a two-year aging requirement, a minimum of really 18 months in barrel, and then the rest has to be in bottle. <clears throat> and then for reserva, you have a three-year age requirement, again, a minimum of 18 months in barrel, and then the rest has to be in bottle before it can be released. So hopefully you're enjoying the wine. Um, let me see what's on my agenda here. Yeah, what's so noble about Vino Noble? It's really its history. It's this idea that it was once upon a time the most important Sangiovese based wine in Tuscany, then it fell out of favor. And then now recently in the last 20, 30 years as it really started to uh, become a, a, a more popular region. But again, it's very producer specific because of the requirements still listed by law where you can have um, as much as 30% of other stuff blended into the wine. And then Montepulciano versus Montepulciano, this idea that Vino Noble de Montepulciano is the name of the village, not the name of Montepulciano grape. <clears throat> There's a bunch of emails for you. <laughs> All right, you guys, any questions? Okay, the question that you, I don't know if you may have heard it, uh, is why does Italy put tough restrictions on wines that are being produced? Um, the, 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 the short answer is it, it, you gotta take it out of the context of government enforcing a thing. It's tradition that became codified. How can I tell from looking at the label when I buy that this is Sangiovese? Thanks Jen for the answer. Okay, the, the short stick of it is you can't. Um, you have to know that, uh, let me, let me, I'm gonna drop my mic and then pick up the bottle here. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, the, the only way that you're gonna know that it's from Tuscany is the fact that you know Vino Noble de Montepulciano has to be Sangiovese based blend. 
Um, that's the only thing that gives this wine away, one, as both a Tuscan wine and two, as a Sangiovese-based wine. Not even the back label says anything about Tuscany or Sangiovese. It says that you shouldn't drink while pregnant, which... Yeah. Only out of only out of your husband's glass. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Just a comment. Hope everyone is starting to understand how complex and knowing about Italian wines can be. Daniel's doing a super job high topping this incredibly complex topic. Keep drinking different Italian wines and discovering their differences. Yeah, I mean I, I mean the, the reality is is when we talk about how complex Italy is, Italy is exponentially more complex than any other growing place on the planet. Not only because of the number of growing areas, but the number of grapes that are grown. Every time you go from a cool climate to a warm climate, um, a warm climate can always grow more varietals. And so when we talk about here in Texas, what do we grow? How do we become the, how do we figure out what grows best here? It's like, well, the reality is in a warmer climate, more can grow. In a cooler climate, you're very limited. And so as you go from north to south in Italy, the, the, the amount of the amount of what's being grown amplifies. Um, and then when you apply that in terms of winemaking and both the culture of winemaking, that becomes infinitely more complex. And so in total, when you add the number of growing areas, um, plus the number of ways a wine can, what grapes a wine can be produced out of, you have in reality over 1400 different classified wine types, if you know what I'm saying. Meaning we have DOC and DOCGs, when you add those together, both in terms of growing area and grapes, you have over 1,400 different classified ways a wine can be labeled. Uh, and therefore, <coughs> excuse me, therefore it becomes super complex in terms of knowing what you're buying and actually learning, learning about these wines. It's such a small area to have so, so many complex wines and so much variety at it. It's fascinating. Too. Yeah, and, and, and hopefully it's, uh, it can be overwhelming, but you just got to drink every day. Oh, we can work on that. You know, <laughs> it's just, it's a simple problem to solve. Okay, the question is, are any whites grown in Tuscany? Yeah, there is, um, uh, let's see, for number 14. Number 14 is the grape of Vernaccia. Vernaccia di San Gimigiano is the only DOCG level white in Tuscany. Anytime you buy a grape that starts with a V, like Vernaccia, Vermentino, Verdicchio, Verdejo, Vino Verde, any of your V wines, V grapes, all of them are super high acid. They're meant to be green, Verde. They're green wines. They're meant to be uh, wines that are, tend to be lighter bodied, higher acid, kind of minerally driven. Uh, but they are all um, uh, kind of that Verde style wine. The other question was about Trebbiano. Trebbiano, of course, Trebbiano is the most planted white grape in, in really all of Italy. Um, Trebbiano is used mainly for both blending, uh, both neutrally, but also for grape spirit. This is your number one grape for making cognac, or excuse me, brandy out of. That brandy then goes into the most famous kind of fortified wine coming out of Tuscany, known as a Vinsanto. Trebbiano in France is known as Uni Blanc. Uni Blanc is the grape that's used for brandy and Armagnac, excuse me, cognac and Armagnac production. So Trebbiano is really a super high acid neutral varietal. Uh, you don't want that grape to have a lot of flavor. When you move Trebbiano around, particularly like in places like Texas or California, um, I've tasted Trebbiano from Arizona and even in, from Australia and South Africa. Um, you get a lot more tropical character. It doesn't really take on that true neutral character that it does in Tuscany. Okay. <clears throat> All right, you guys. So let's kind of carry the conversation forward. We're going to move to California. Not in reality. Let's not do that. <laughs> I opened up a can of worms. That president guy's been building the wall in the wrong place. <laughs> hey, you never know. You know, walls are, sometimes walls aren't good for anybody. No, they're not. 
So the very, here we go. I think every time I go to a screen share and then back again, it disrupts the, the main camera feed, but it's all good. Um, okay, we have Italy, we have Tuscany, I need California, California map. Did that get shared? Yes. Okay. Am I in the video when I share screen? Oh, I have a little face. So okay. you, I can see you on my iPad, Daniel. Okay. It's like in the corner. You're down in the corner and you're moving again. Okay. So you're alive. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so let's talk about California. Um, when we talk about California, there are four main growing areas. Um, they're all known as multi-county AVAs. AVA, if you don't know, American Viticultural Area. You have North Coast, <clears throat> And then you have your um, central coast, number three, the largest growing area of the four. Number, number four is your south coast, and then number two is your Sierra foothills, okay? Um, part of this conversation is what makes California special. And there's a lot that makes California special in terms of wine production. I don't know about anything else. We'll talk about wine. Um, again, just like where we have uh, Tawar elements that affect Italy, we have Tawar elements that affect uh, California. Here we have basically series of mountain ranges. We have the Pacific Ocean to deal with. And the reality is, is California is built on the San Andres Fault. And so what that really means is anytime you hear the word fault line and wine growing area, really what you should take away from that is this idea that you have very old geological formations mixing and mingling with newer geological formations, and therefore you have a multitude of different types of soil types kind of layered on top of one another. Think about like a seven layer dip, except it's seven layers of different types of soil. So when people talk about the complexity and the uniqueness of Napa Valley, Napa Valley itself has been, you know, they've studied this, they've shown that there's really almost 30 to 35 different types of soil types within Napa Valley alone. And so as you move across the different growing areas, soil composition changes, but the reality is, is that there's a mixture of different types of soils um, that play a major impact. Uh, number two is obviously the Pacific Ocean, a, a much cooler body of water than the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> and the effects of that, both in terms of the, the cool air that it gives off, but also the idea that it mitigates heat within a growing region pretty well because it is such a cool bodied water. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Lodi, but before that, let's, let's set the stage for what makes Lodi um, unique. And really, it's, it's why Napa Valley and the northern part of the Central Coast are unique. Uh, let me see if I can make this screen a little bit smaller, okay. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm gonna talk about is basically the gap here between the North Coast and the Central Coast. <clears throat> Obviously, what ends up happening, we have a mountain range called the Sierra Nevada mountain range that is this way. Then we have the Central Valley, the, basically the largest farm and agricultural land in the country is through this part. And then within the North Coast, we have uh, what is known as the, the uh, the, the coastal range, which is a range that goes both on the borders, the coast, and it goes through the north coast, then it skips a beat, and then it picks up in the central coast and goes all the way down. And then right past Paso Robles, which is kind of here, if you will, this mountain range basically, instead of going north to south, goes uh, east to west. And so we have a, kind of another gap in the mountain range here, and then it picks up and kind of ends um, <clears throat> in the south. <clears throat> this is basically Santa Barbara kind of down here. This is San Francisco Bay around here. And we have this mountain range that blocks cool air everywhere else from going inland, except for in these two places. One, San Francisco Bay, which is now known as the Petaluma Gap. And then we have down here, uh, where we have places like Santa Rita, Santa Lucia Highlands, uh, Santa Barbara, these cooler climate areas down here, okay? 
Okay, so what ends up happening in a growing season, we have cool air that comes off the Pacific, it enters the Petaluma Gap, and then when it enters the Petaluma Gap, that cool air basically spreads both to the north, it goes upward, and then it goes downward, and then it goes straight across, okay? So in reality, when we talk about cool climate farming, cool climate grape growing in California, really what we're talking about are places where the, the access to the, the gaps or access to the Pacific Ocean are, are easy. There's no mountain range blocking the way. So down here, you have Sonoma, you have Russian River, you have Carneros. And then as you move up, you have places like the warmest growing climate in the North Coast would basically be Calistoga, which is the northern part of the North Coast uh, would be the warmest. And conversely, on the other side, the coolest part of the Central Coast is the north part of the Central Coast. And as you work your way down, it gets warmer and warmer. Paso Robles probably being the warmest. Then you have another gap. And then you have Central Lucia Highlands, Santa Rita, Santa Barbara, and you have a cool climate once again. And then obviously the South Coast uh, basically is Temecula, and which is an hour's drive or so from Los Angeles, uh, is much warmer, okay? So all that being said, we are basically gonna talk about the cool air that comes off the Pacific, goes through the Petaluma Gap, and then exactly 100 miles from San Francisco, we basically hit Lodi. And Lodi is in the direct path of the cool breezes that come off the Petaluma Gap, but it does, it does, it gets that airflow in a much more inland environment. <clears throat> and so this next image is the Sierra foothills. And you can see where Lodi sits. Lodi is a kind of a multi-county growing, growing area that sits both within San Joaquin County and the Sacramento County. And that's where we're gonna carry the conversation. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up a different image. If you guys aren't drinking the cab, the cab that you're drinking is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, 12 months in both new and neutral French oak from Lodi. And you'll notice that Lodi cab uh, is never gonna be as full bodied as let's say a Napa Valley cab is gonna be, mainly because you have this influence of of cool air coming into it, but it also sits within the San Joaquin and Sacramento River Delta, which mitigates heat as well. So let me pull up a different image. This is a map of Lodi. Can I play some music to go along with this? I can. What would you like? Here we go. CCR. <laughs> Um, is that before my time? I don't know. I feel like I've heard of that. But. I think oh, it's man. before your time. I feel old if that's yes. before his time. Creedence Clearwater Revival is called Oh, Lodi. okay. I know. <laughs> that. There you go. Daniel, I'll clue you in one of these days. Yes. Okay. So here's, here's the outline of Lodi. Lodi, as of 2006. Well, okay, let me back up. 1980, 1986 is when Lodi actually became known as a growing area for, for as an AVA. Lodi AVA became classified as a growing area in 1986. 20 years later in 2006, they basically <clears throat> subdivided it into seven different AVAs. And so you can kind of see these are the seven different AVAs. Um, the ones that are the most important <clears throat> in terms of grape growing and history is really this growing area right here, the Makalumni River Valley. Um, this is Makalumni and Kasumni. These are all Native American uh, uh, names from the native tribes that live there. And what ends up happening is this cool air comes basically from the west to the east, comes across the, the, the delta here, and it blows directly into the Makalumni River growing area, and then it and then it dissipates. Here you can start to see the elevation starts to change. You have the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains um, and growing areas change. So this growing area, the Makalumni River is the coolest growing area within Lodi. And then everything else tends to be either warmer as you move further north. Um, and as you move into the foothills, they tend to be a little bit more, uh, not only higher elevation, 
but they also tend to be a little bit more rainfall and soil changes. So what's unique about this as its primary growing area, the Makalumni River, is that by the time the, the runoff from the mountain ranges ends up here, all that sedimentary runoff, this becomes a very sandy growing area. And you know, really we talk about Lodi as one region and that's fine. Um, I'm gonna talk about it as a focus on this region because this is really where the heart of kind of world-class production is coming from. Those wines that you should seek out should be coming from here. Mainly because these are very sandy soils, which means that um, <clears throat> when we talk about the history of the region, this is the very first region that is actually planted mainly because of the river and mainly because of the gold rush. So when you have people moving east to west during the 19th century, um, what you end up having is that the Sierra Nevada mountains become the heart of the gold rush time period. Uh, places like Stockton become super famous uh, for both uh, the gold rush settlements, but then the, the river itself here becomes the main river where gold would be um, kind of, what's the verb for uh, panning gold? Is that the term? I don't know. Yes. Panning? Yeah, that sounds right. I just made it up, but it sounds correct. <laughs> like this entire presentation. <laughs> you're, you're panning for gold. <laughs> Seriously. Um, okay, so what ends up happening is this becomes a, a prolific region for, 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 for miners. As a result, to quench kind of miners' thirst, they start planting grapes. Um, and this becomes the oldest place in the world for old vines in, or let me rephrase that. This becomes the, the oldest place on earth for Zinfandel period, and then over time it becomes old vines in. So this region was first planted in 1886. And uh, it is, when you look at Lodi as a whole, there's over 100,000 acres of vines planted within the Lodi area, and over 2,000 acres are considered old vines in, meaning planted pre-prohibition. Most of that acreage is planted in the Makalumni River uh, area. And then the other very old vine is Carignan. Carignan is the other old vine. And, and what's unique is I'm saying old vine, meaning, yes, they were planted a long time ago. What I also mean is own rooted, meaning this, because of the sandy soils here, <clears throat> are, are um, resistant to phylloxera. So these vines have never been grafted. And as a result, they have become protected. They are now part of a, an historical winemaking association to protect old vine production within the region. And so first and foremost, when we talk about Lodi wine, we talk about Zinfandel uh, as the most important planting. Uh, Lodi actually produces right around a third to a quarter of all the Zinfandel produced in California. Its second most popular varietal is Cabernet, which is what you're drinking. And uh, it's unfortunate that Lodi um, hasn't really developed uh, sooner than it has, mainly because it's, it's mainly a farming area. And so today, when you look at the number of wineries, there's about 70 to 80 wineries, obviously that grows every year, uh, but there's exponentially 10 to 11 times more growers than there are producers in the growing area. And so historically, this is places that become the, the, the farmed vineyards for very large brands like Woodbridge from Mandavi um, and Seven Deadly Zins, if you've ever had that wine. Um, all those wines come from Lodi. So it's a region that a lot of other regions tap into for quality fruit, but that you see very little uh, actual in terms of producers that are producing high quality wines. Obviously that is changing over time, but the reality is, is it's still underdeveloped um, in terms of what's really happening in terms of a consumer. Those of you that have actually traveled uh, in the, the north coast between Russian River, Sonoma, and Carneros, Highway 12 is the, tw is the highway that you take that goes basically west to east. Highway 12 basically takes you directly through Lodi, and that's this highway right here. So if you ever go to California and you're trying to go to Lodi, it's just Highway 12 headed east, and it takes you directly to Lodi, the center of Lodi, the town of Lodi, and then into the Makalumi River. Region. Hey Daniel. Yeah. Uh, this Craig, this particular wine is from our growing partner, uh, which is just outside of Linden, California, which you can see to the northeast of Stockton. 
and it's an estate grown Cabernet. Um, but just wanted to kind of point oh, out yeah. where, where within the AVA it came from. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Craig. I, did, I really didn't have a tech sheet to put together for this wine, so I'm glad yep. you said that. All estate grown. <clears throat> Okay, so um, so this is obviously Lodi. As you move east pro into, technically Lodi is a, an AVA that sits within the Central Valley. It is not within the larger contract contra construct of the Sierra Nevada AVA, which is to the east of that. Um, as we move further east, we get into a much drier climate, uh, a more uh, hilly climate, and then eventually we hit the mountain range, and then we get to very hot climate. Um, okay, there's one other thing to talk about Lodi historically that's, it's not really important, but it's unique in that prior to Prohibition, when we talk about grape growing and winemaking, but also the idea of consuming grapes, um, because Lodi sits within the Central Valley, it's very important growing area, uh, by itself, but then when prohibition happens, um, what it, what the thought is is that Lodi, in terms of its wine industry at that time, would suffer. But in reality, if you understand how prohibition was set up, it wasn't illegal to make wine in your home. So Lodi actually becomes a very important center for grape production for wines that's being sent outside of California, sent eastward for people to make wines in their home. Some of those grapes include Zinfandel but most of them include grapes called Alicante Boucher, and then also a, a, a native table grape that could be used for wine production called Flame Tukai. And Flame Tukai, um, while is a non-existent grape in all intents and purposes today, is historically a very famous grape in Lodi that was used as both a table wine grape, but that could also be used as a wine making grape. And there's not many of those grapes used today. Uh, today, when you go to, uh, well, if you go to Lodi, it, nobody knows really about uh, uh, Flame 2K, but it is a vine that, or a grape that the leaves turn into what looks like, it looks like they're on fire. They look like flames. They're very uh, orange and amber, and they look like they've produced flames. Um, and they're just highly colorful tiles of wine. And they're very rich to the culture and the history of the place. And there's certain high schools like the I was reading earlier about the grape itself, and they said that even like uh, Lodi is where Robert Mondavi grew up, and Robert Mondavi's um, mascot was the flames based off of the flame Tukai. And so there was really two high schools in his growing area. One was called Tukai High, and one was called Lodi High, uh, to kind of give uh, homage back to the importance of the grape. So that is a very minor grape. Uh, they were also talking about how Tukai, flame Tukai was kind of part of, you know, local um, civic fairs and local um, rodeos where they would see who could grow like the, the largest cluster or make the best wine out of this local grape. So there is a, a, a local history there that really nobody talks about because it's not really relevant in terms of wine ball today. I know that some of you have, did not join us on Monday for the class on Rioja and Bordeaux, the 05 Vintage. One of the slides I was talking about Vino de Pagos in terms of the Spanish wine classification system and that at the very top of that classification system was a category called Vino de, de, Pago, Vino de, Vino, Vino de Pagos, which is uh, basically single vineyard wines from a single estate uh, from a producer that has a high level of reputation. Um, I made two comments. One is that there's currently 14. My data was incorrect. There's currently 17 Vino de Pagos. And then the last comment was I, I, I mentioned that those producers are within Rioja and the Ribera del Duero region. Technically, those producers are, are really, none of them are actually, I made the mistake of saying none of them are actually in Rioja. There are a few in Ribera del Duero, but most of those producers exist within the Castilla-La Mancha growing area and in the Navarra region, Navarra being that region that hugs Rioja. And so the problem kind of going back to why this is a complicated thing is that you will see the term Pago and, and when it is applied to winemaking in Spain really means a vineyard. So you will see many brands use the term Pago in their brand name, but that doesn't mean that they are a vino de Pago. And 
yet more confusion for the consumer. It seems like wherever you go in any region you go to, there's always these things that contradict one another that make the wine, the idea of wine buying and understanding wine even more complicated. Vino de Pago being one of them. So hopefully that'll be corrected um, uh, if you are interested in that. Um, and then lastly, uh, again, I'm trying to get these videos recorded. They will be on YouTube. Once we kind of figure out the internet situation here, I'll be able to upload them much quicker. They will be uh, a kind of a private link, which I'll share to everyone that received the Zoom information. Um, we are looking to continue these classes past COVID quarantine timeframe. So if this is something you really are interested in, if you have topics you would like to talk about, please let me know. Um, I am not, I'm looking to <clears throat> add other educators, not just myself. There's a couple of people that have already reached out and expressed interest to do classes. Um, some of them you know are very reputable people in Austin. Some of them you may not know, but have a world of information to give. So I know that right now there's classes lined up for Chile. There's classes lined up on natural wine. Um, and so if there's any topics that you are really interested in, let us know. We'll, we'll just create a curriculum. And it seems to be like these two wines at a time make it ideal for, you know, who can't drink two bottles in a day? <laughs> you know, so uh, I know that it's very difficult unless you have a Coravan to do more than two bottles. But at least if you're going to drink a wine today and you can't drink it all, drink the cab, save the Sangiovese or the rest of it for tomorrow. That's the one that will actually taste better tomorrow. Um, so there's always that wine that will live the next day. So that being said, you guys, I hope everyone had a really great time today. I appreciate it. Hopefully you're enjoying your beautiful weather. Uh, I love it here at Vinovium, and hopefully we can toast and see each other here soon. Hey, Daniel, this yes, is sir. Craig. Before we wrap up, could you just say, I think people would enjoy knowing, a, a, just a couple of comments about the difference in the oak that was used for both the Vino Nobile de Montepulciano and Oh, the, sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Definitely. Right. Okay. So the let's start with the Sangiovese. The Vino Noble is very traditional production. This is um, a, a producer that uh, has gained a lot of notoriety over the last couple of years in particular because they just started being imported in the United States about five years ago. They are a, uh, a producer that really started back in 1964, 65 timeframe. They are committed to producing some of the best wines of the region. This blend is 90% Sangiovese, 10% Caniolo Nero, two red grapes, uh, all indigenous varietals. And then the oak production here is very large format Slovenian cask. Uh, and what I mean by large format, uh, some of their casks are 300 liters all the way up to 800 liters. Really what we're talking about is, uh, excuse me, um, in terms of gallons, you know, between 800 and 1200 gallon large format neutral barrel. Um, and so part of that character is you have less oak influence, less oxidation from oak. Uh, just because you have more volume in the barrel. So oak is never really the star. It's always about the fruit, always about the place. Uh, and then on the Lodi wine, it is a combination of both new and neutral French oak. So Barrique, 225 liter uh, uh, barrel sizes, which is 55 gallons. And so oak is very much at the forefront. And, and you can kind of tell from, from the cab, the cab is riper. It has really kind of intense, almost like medicinal candy cherry components. And that oak just adds a little bit more of that uh, uh, character to the wine. So you get a little bit more cherry, a little bit more sweetness uh, and very varietally correct, but at the same time, not over the top tannic because we're not using a ton of new French oak. The alcohol content on the cab is really 13.4%. And then you can see on the back of your bottle of the day, which is 14.5%. So incredibly ripe wines, but the Lodi, because of its climate, has some restraint to it, which makes it great for everyday drinking. Thank you very much. You got it. Any other questions, you guys? I hate to ask this, but how long will the cab and Montepulciano last after opening? Um, About 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> At my ass. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, the, the Sangiovese has more acid. It's going to last another day open. The cab, I think, is going to start to, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have enough structure there to kind of keep it going for more than a day. So I would drink it. All right, friends. We'll see you later. Have a great rest of the afternoon.